Hi guys, it's Adam and welcome to another video. So in today's video, I'm just going to do a brief roundup of my first year at university. Now it's currently the 4th of June, I've been finished for a couple of weeks now, that was my last exam. In fact, it was really, really good because um, I had finished my lectures on about the 5th of May and I didn't think that was going to be the case. I thought we would finish lectures sort of later May, maybe around the time of me having my last exam, which was the 20th. And uh, so that was quite good. Of course, we did have uh, a week or so to do revision, which was OK. Um, and I was very focused on revision and made sure that I was doing it well because I mean, in January, I did do a, a good bit of revision, but I really wanted to make sure this time that I did even more. Um, and that really saw me in good stead. I mean, that's the one piece of advice I would give to any university student. And I know not everyone does it at university. You know, people like to kind of rest on the laurels a bit or party or whatever it may be. But the one piece of advice I would give to any university student is just plow down and get the revision done you know, a few weeks before the exams, two weeks, three weeks before the exams, start getting up early, start doing five, six hours of revision a day, you know, maybe in the in the three week period, you know, like sort of way back here, let's say it's three weeks to the exam, maybe in that period, two or three hours. But then especially if you get into like the, the two weeks before, you know, four, five, six hours a day, if you can take breaks in between, uh, for, you know, going on walks, meeting people, just speaking to people within your flat or something like that, because obviously you need that time. Um, but yeah, just, just crack on with revision because it will really help. And it massively helped with my confidence with the exam, especially one of the exams on neuroanatomy. And, uh, I just, I knew so much of what I was meant to do because of the revision. But if I didn't do the revision, obviously, as you would expect, there's no way I would have, would have known what to do. So um, what I'm going to do in this video is just give you like a brief overview of the year. Obviously, if someone's watching this or someone ends up finding it on the search um, who's interested in psychology, that'll be quite good for them. Um, I'm also going to give you maybe uh, a little bit of an idea of how it is living in halls, that sort of stuff. Um, obviously, I will go into... Um, a little bit of the content of the course. I am aware that I can digress quite a lot, so I'll try not to digress. I'll try and keep it, you know, brief and factual, and that's that. Um, and yeah, I'll just tell you generally, I'll save the more personal stuff till the end, but I'll tell you generally at the end, uh, more of the personal side of things and, and how I've enjoyed the year. But what we'll start off with is we'll, we'll start off with the more practical and conscientious side, which is what the course is about and uh, the layout of it. So the course, if you don't know, I'm doing a BSc in psychology uh, with honours. There's no tie to that. So for example, I could have chose to do psychology with neuropsychology or psychology with clinical health psychology. And there's also variants of the course as well. I think they're at Bangor, but also they are at uni other universities if they're not all at Bangor. But you can do psychology and business or psychology in a language or psychology in this or whatever it may be. But my specific course, straight psychology. Um, and that's really good because it gives you a good wide array of subjects. So I just taught you through it. Now, it is a BSc, which means it's a Bachelor of the Sciences. And so it's obviously a research based, scientific based based on scientific literature. I have been aware from uh, some people talking in the group chat. We have a big group chat on, on Facebook for psychology. I have been aware that some people have mentioned the fact that there is the opportunity to do a BA in psychology. Now, I've not researched that particularly myself, so I wouldn't want to give too much information on that. But that might be something to look into, let's say, if you want to do psychology or just to look into it um, because it might be quite interesting. Um, specifically, I think the BA would be more to do with... Um, sort of wholly focused on psychoanalytic stuff, depth psychology, maybe humanistic psychology, things like that, maybe even a bit of counselling and stuff um, alongside that, because that, that's kind of, kind of quite a natural pairing. Um, of course, counsellors can somewhat slightly do it differently than 
uh, let's say, complete depth psychologists, but there's a very, very strong overlap there. Um, but I can't tell you for certain that that's the case, because as I say, I've not looked into uh, particularly the structure of uh, if I was to do, or if anyone else was to do, a BA in psychology. Uh, but what I will focus on is this course, the BSc, and uh, it's very scientific based. It's based around research articles, research literature, all that sort of stuff. So that is to say you go on Google Scholar, you go on Science Direct and you type something in, for example, social anxiety disorder, and it will pull up all of the necessary uh, scientific research for that particular thing. And you can go through in the, in the journal article and you can look and read all about that. And then you can use that journal article to, of course, uh, for, for a reference in your assignment. Or sometimes if you've got a written exam, because sometimes the exams are multiple choice, sometimes they're written. Or, of course, if it's a written exam, you can use it in there as a reference. So that's kind of um, a basic understanding. We also have assignments and exams, like I just mentioned. So the assignments are obviously... Um, it's kind of like essays, uh, you will get research articles, you will write a little bit of kind of, obviously you can't write your opinion, but you kind of have to put it into your own words. So uh, it's a bit paradoxical that because it's not your opinion, but yet you are putting it in your own words in, in some sense. Um, but basically it's scientifically putting it in your own words. So it's making sure you're using scientific language, you're getting the references, you're, you're putting that research into your own words, you're putting your little reference at the end of that paragraph or of that sentence, and then you're, you're creating a story and you're creating a, a flowing assignment uh, on whatever it is you're discussing. Of course, with some of the negative research and some of the positive research, that is to say, some of the research that supports the argument and some that actually discounts the argument and then you get a good balance and then at the end you can summarize and uh, you can say based on the research what is the sort of most likely uh, situation or what is the most likely kind of um, conclusion and you wouldn't necessarily say that you've proved anything you just say that the research suggests that this might be more accurate for example in the case of we could take the case of uh, environmental psychology, which is very hot at the moment, as you would expect, uh, with regards to things like building design and things like environmentally friendly building design. If you look at any of the scientific literature on that, you see quite clearly uh, in favour of um, a, an environmental design in a building. Uh, that's things like having plants in the building, having plants on the sides of buildings outside, which mo most likely you will have seen before, um, having natural, having copious amounts of natural light in the building, designing the building in a way that uh, is conducive to um, kind of mental health with regards to the patterns of nature. So, for example, trees and plants and things like that, um, they're generally quite uh, whimsical and they're generally quite curved and stuff like that. So putting curved designs in buildings can sometimes be, be quite good because it reflects certain patterns in nature that are, that are just naturally there. And so therefore it makes it easier on the brain uh, to, to stand those environments rather than more square, solid, um, what we'd say typically, typically human environments that, that don't necessarily reflect the, the ways of nature. And it's uh, interesting, actually, because I've, I've watched a lot of Alan Watts, as many people know. It's interesting that I've just called to mind uh, uh, some of um, his lectures there when he was talking about that, uh, about how actually humans generally tend to build things in squares and boxes and stuff like that. And that's not the, the natural way. So, um, of course, even within the 21st century, for example, a lot of the research that we do in research psychology and scientific psychology it's just echoing kind of common sense in a way. And I like to I like to um, make make people aware of that because, yeah, it's well all well and good doing the scientific research on these things. But a lot of the time it is common sense and a lot of people do just naturally understand it in that manner. And uh, and so it's quite nice, actually, to to prove those things that are 
mainly common sense, let's say, but now we know them in a scientific manner, or we, we understand, maybe not prove, but we understand them more in a scientific manner, and we can suggest more about those things. So that's generally the, the idea of, let's say, an assignment. Of course, an exam, we have them in uh, January and July, sorry, not July, uh, May, June even, and um, basically the exams either multiple choice or they're kind of assignment essay based and um or if they're not that they are um oh no i just said assignment essay based there we go i'm, I'm getting ahead of myself I'm, my brain's going too fast um so yeah assignment essay based or they're, they're multiple choice and uh uh they're not too bad actually i mean obviously if you um do your what's the word revision if you do your re revision, the exams are not so bad. They're, they're okay, especially the multiple choice ones. Multiple choice is always good because, of course, you've got a 25% chance anyway. You're not, you're not going to really statistically get less than 25%. I mean, it might be possible, but statistically, it's unlikely that you're going to get less than 25%. So that's all well and good as it is, especially if there's four choices. So you're not too bad there. But, of course, if you do a good bit of revision which is what really you should be doing, but if you do a good bit of revision, then you are, you're pretty safe and you're pretty sound. So some of the multiple choice exams, not too bad. And generally the lecturers do go quite easy on you. I mean, not really easy, but in some of the questions, they're, they're not too bad. They're not too bad. For someone with a, a good level of intelligence and who's done their revision, they're not too bad at all. Some of the questions are a little bit more challenging, of course, and generally what you find is that the lecturers will put the easier questions first and then sort of increasing in hardness. So then obviously at the end, there might be a few more tricky questions. Um, I don't know exactly why they do that from a psychological viewpoint, actually. That would be something quite interesting to look into. Uh, maybe it's just a sort of natural flow of easy to hard. It might just be something like that. There might be no psychological implication involved, although I would probably suggest that there is. It's probably something that is planned and is structured in that way. Um, but no, it, you know, it's not too bad. The, the exams that are assignment-based, they're a little bit more tricky because you have to write quite a lot in a certain time period. I mean, you're writing an assignment in, a, in, a, in an exam time period. So you can imagine the, the constraints there and how challenging that can be. So especially if you've got to get research as well in that time. So you, you have to do some citations. Now, they don't um, need you to do a reference list. So you don't, that, that's to say, you don't have to do uh, a separate page where you have to format these references in a certain manner, have them in alphabetical order, have them in a certain font, in a certain style, etc. Um, you don't have to do that in the, the exam. You just have to put uh, what's known as an in-text citation in, which is just a little in brackets, the name of the researcher and then the, the date of publication. So it's not too bad uh, in that sense. But doing, actually thinking and writing that assignment in the time span of the exam, that is quite hard. And I would prefer it and I would kind of uh, raise my point along with others, I think, uh, that maybe they do go too hard on us in those specific exams. The multiple choice aren't so bad, but the assignments, I think they give us too much to do in the, in the time scale. And uh, that is um that's not the best i think that really they could um especially when you've got to do it in an exam hall like for example it's not so bad this year because we have an extended time period to do it on our computers but normally it would be in an exam hall and normally it'd be even stricter time scales so in those stricter time scales i don't think it's particularly too fair but then again they structure it in this way if it works, it works, and if students can just about do it, then fair enough, then that's okay. Um, but yeah, those are the more challenging exams anyway. So with regards, so that's exams, assignments, that sort of stuff, and and in each module, uh, just this is a good bridging link to talking about the modules actually. In each module, we have generally an exam and an assignment. Now, in some modules, we have two or three assignments, but no exam. Um, and in 
one module this year, we had an ex a larger exam, but no no assignments. So that was kind of like the opposite way around. Um, but generally, on the whole, it's one assignment, one exam for a module. And we have five modules per semester. Now, psychology at Bangor is one of the big three, which is one of the big three schools. Zoology, psychology, and I don't know what the other one is. I feel like it's something like oceanography or marine biology or something like that, because, of course, we're near the coast, so that's quite popular here. Um, but the, two of the big big three are definitely zoology and psychology anyway. So it's, um, it's a big school, and uh, it's one of the best for psychology in the UK as well, so they do uh, put quite a few modules in per semester. Now, other people I've spoke to on different courses have three modules per semester or four modules. Obviously, as I say, with psychology being the way it is, being the discipline it is, five modules per semester. Now, two of those modules are what's known as core modules, and you have to pass those, and they are required for, of course, psychology, for being a psychologist, for, be, for understanding the things you need to understand as a psychologist, the basic stuff. And interestingly enough, they're not actually to do with, let's say, what you would imagine psychology to be. Um, for example, the um, stereotypical idea of psychology, but yet they are very necessary to psychology. And those two modules are research methods, which are statistics, which I suppose you could, you could imagine is a bit more in line with psychology, but not particularly because you, you'd think, well, you know, the stereotypical idea of psychology is, well, Freud or depth psychology or or even maybe to a degree uh, a behavior analyst or something like that. Um, but no, statistics is very much um, a part of psychology in regard with regards to the research side of psychology. And then the other core module is scientific writing and communication, which is, of course, like I talked about with the assignments, writing in a scientific way, making sure we're we're presenting our findings in a way that's um, I don't know, just confined to a scientific manner and, and not saying things in a colloquial manner or in a in a more kind of informal or creative. Well, I mean, there is creativity in scientific writing, actually, but in a more informal manner. Let's stick with that rather than kind of excluding creativity there, because in fact, there can be quite a lot of romanticism and creativity in uh, producing a research report or in producing a um, an assignment. And in fact, I've, I've noticed that when I've been writing them. And it's something that I've had to battle with because I always have this internal battle between what Jung called, of course, uh, the uh, tension of the opposites, holding the tension of the opposites. And that is science. Well, for me, particularly, that is science and spirituality or science and mysticism because I have both of those big sides of my personality, um, the emotions and the rationality, which also could be um, analogous to the to the kind of general idea of the two hemispheres of the brain with the left side being more calculation and the right side being more emotion. Um, and uh, it, it's not so much the case that we can say, you know, well, the left side is solely mathematics and the right side is solely creativity or anything like that. That would be like a real overgeneralization. But there's kind of a, a sort of split between calculation on the left side and on the right side emotions. And so um, it, it kind of is analogous to that with like the right side, you know, spirituality and the, and the, the two kind of um, in a way playing within me you know, and, uh, and so I have to, I've all, I've, what I've, I've struggled with immensely over this course is really committing myself fully, and I still struggle with this, to the scientific side, because of course I all, my spiritual side always wants to come in, and then conversely, when I'm being very spiritual, my scientific side wants to come in and think, well, okay, so this is this spiritual phenomena, so how can we make this empirical? How can we understand this in a science? So the two work like that, you see. And uh, so, you know, we, we, we have that. But there is a, uh, as I say, there is a lot of kind of romanticism and, and creativity within kind of um, producing those, those research reports and, and doing those sorts of things. And there is a lot of creativity in scientific writing. Once you've kind of learned 
the basics of understanding how to go about it. When you learn the basics of how to go about it and what the university expects and the way in which they want to want you to present the work, then you can have a little bit of a play because you know what you're doing. And if you know what you're doing, you can just push the limits a bit and you can you can kind of get a, you can you can put a little bit of creativity in there and a little bit of um sort of natural exuberance and, and, and life in there as well. And I think that's necessary for um, scientific writing because you can over-intellectualize it and you can overdo it on the very, very clinical side. And I, I mean, I'm as much prone to that as anyone. Um, but I think just being able to put a little bit of creativity in there without detracting from the scientific value and the scientific validity of that piece of work. That's good. That's what it needs. You see, science needs a little bit of artistry in it. And art, in a way, needs a little bit of scientific rationalism in it. I mean, you, you see this in things like cubism or, you know, art, art uh, ideas like that, where they use geometry. And I mean, I suppose that's more mathematics in a way. But it, it still ties in that kind of rationalism and it kind of enhances the artwork in a way and it brings it something because art has to have just a little bit of that scientific rationalism in and science just has to have a little bit of that romantic art artistry in to make it nice, to make it that that beautiful little morsel of, of flavour and, uh, and of culture rather than it just being solely this or solely that. Um, but no, so that's scientific writing and communication. Now, so we have those two modules. We have those two modules in each semester. So in semester one, we had research methods one and SWAC one. In semester two, we had research methods two and SWAC two. And of course, those two in the last, in the second semester, we're just building on the stuff that we did in the first semester and just adding some stuff to it as well and, and getting us a bit more familiar with the concepts we were talking about in semester one. Now, the other three modules are a mix, and these are more typically what you would imagine uh, psychology to be like. So, for example, in the, the first semester, we did the psychology of uh, religion and spirituality, which, of course, for me, being the way I am, I enjoyed that module. That was very interesting. It was very interesting for me to get a scientific perspective on it, some a modern scientific perspective on it, because, of course, for me, uh, with the psychology of religion and spirituality, I've always dealt in depth psychology, mythological symbolism, um, ideas of uh, what certain things could mean from religions and spirituality in the context of an intuitive psychological und understanding. So to get a modern scientific perspective on some of those ideas was very, very interesting. And we looked at uh, the big five traits in relation to religion and, and religiosity and how that might uh, come into effect religiosity and what certain traits of people might be prone to being more, more religious. We looked at certain um, uh, psychological uh, disorders and things like that and how uh, they kind of possibly relate to religiosity as well. And of course, we have to be, and, and I was hesitant to say that there because we do have to be careful with that because um, there are certain links with certain disorders to uh, a heightened interest in, let's say, numinous things, spiritual things, religious things. But there's very much many, many other people who, of course, don't have any disorders or anything who indulge in religion and spirituality. So, um and I don't want to indulge myself like sometimes I can do in this very black and white thinking. Um, and, and, and I think that some sometimes scientists and, and sometimes atheists as well, specifically fervent atheists, can indulge too much in that. And they can, cat let's, let's say especially like new atheists or something like that, can categorise religion and spirituality as something that is... Uh, to be purged and something that is wrong and something that is to do with a negative side of human experience. Um, and it, it's not the case. But what I do want to say for clarity is that, yes, there has been links made between certain disorders and an increased um, interest in spirituality, religiosity, um, 
ideas of uh, uh, cult, you know, uh, occultism, but also cults and things like that. Um, specifically, there's one thing which is a sort of a lower form of schizophrenia, schizophrenia which is um, uh, schizotypal personality disorder. And it's characterized by uh, Robert Slapalski says this by metamagical thinking and uh, the tendency to always think in terms of um, uh, everything uh, is is spiritual. Every single thing has meaning. Everything is uh, some sort of signs, ev you know, all these kind of things, but to a very, very heightened degree. And um, these may be the individuals who strike you as very, very introverted, um, kind of a little bit, you know, removed from society, a little bit odd, a little bit strange, things like that. Um, not necessarily in an eccentric way, because we also have to make sure that we're pulling apart, let's say, natural eccentricity and these sorts of things, because there is a natural exuberant eccentricity that actually can be quite extroverted. Um, but then there's actually kind of an introverted, almost weird uh, eccentricity that is very insular and uh, that can be that can be uh, or can denote some sort of association with that particular dis disorder. And uh, uh, and so there's many people, there's many schizotypes, and these are quite normal people as well, in a sense. I mean, you would meet them and you wouldn't necessarily say, well, oh, they've got schizotypal personality disorder. But there, there might be something with them. They may be a bit more introverted or da di da di da um, And Robert Sapolsky uh, po points out, which is very interesting, actually, that uh, these people might have certain jobs that are quite introverted. And, and, and the, they maybe don't hang around with colleagues, particularly in those jobs. They might be quite isolated jobs and things like that. And that's quite interesting, actually. Um, but certainly there has been links there. But more generally, just speaking from a, uh, uh, well, I was going to say a psychopathological perspective, but I don't think that would be a psychopathological uh, disorder specifically. Um, although I might be wrong in saying that. But speaking from a more general perspective, excluding any disorders or anything like that, um, religion, religiosity, spirituality has been very, very strongly, strongly linked, Spe specifically spirituality, less so religiosity, but more so spirituality has been strongly linked to trait openness, which I kind of already in intuitively thought before I knew, before I got on the course, because I'm very high in trait openness, and I knew that my spiritual experiences, I had already been doing little bits of research on this, and I thought my spiritual experiences must be correlated with trait openness because that's one of the only things that I could have defined. Um, so it has been very, very strongly correlated with trait openness. So that means to say if you are higher in trait openness, openness to experience, that is uh, being open to um, indulging in, in different experiences in life, whatever that may be, culture, food, um, go, you know, maybe social experience, wh whatever it may be, um, that, you know, adventurousness, all that sort of stuff, then you're going to be more likely to favour the, the spiritual life, shall we say, or, or spirituality. So that was very, very interesting. So that was one of the modules we did. We touched upon some, and I forgot them now, actually. Uh, it'd be very good to actually go back and, and research these again. But we touched upon some very niche um, uh, psychological disorders as well that only arise in certain cultures. And uh, there was one particular disorder, and I'm only going to talk about it in the capacity that I know of it, which is a very sort of restricted capacity. Um, but I'm going to restrain myself because I don't want to talk um, without me not knowing about it, you see. But there was one disorder in some sort of Indonesian culture, and it is only found in that particular part of the world. And it's a disorder with regards to, um, I think it's inclusive of male aggression as well. But the main characteristic is that men are afraid to lose sperm. And when they lose sperm, let's say they masturbate or something like that, when they lose sperm, I think it was, if I remember the slide rightly, it was that they feel 
empty. They feel kind of this sense of um, loss of something, a loss of vitality, a loss of life force and things like that. And that is a psychological disorder totally culturally culturally bound to this one specific area and it doesn't occur anywhere else as far as as far as we know yet we may find research out that it does um but that's very very interesting i mean from a mythological interpretation you could say well the sperm represents some sort of life life energy because of course sperm turns into a baby well, along with the, the union with the egg of course and so uh, that sperm is a potential life it's a life force and so that kind of psychological phenomena of feeling this kind of loss of vitality of uh, also synonymous with that a loss of life force that could be relating at least in a um I don't know, you know, a mythological setting or a, a mythological intuitive interpretation on that, that level of experience um, uh, as, as that really, you know, there's that association that could be made there. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a very, very interesting, uh, interesting one, Matt, and I very much lear uh, enjoyed learning about it. Now, in the first semester, I, I did go into quite a bit of detail on that one. I won't go into as much detail on all the others. Because we will be here for hours, wouldn't we? I mean, we're already here for 31 minutes. It's crazy with me. So another one of the modules we did, which is, I, I like this one, it's behaviorism. Uh, I enjoy behaviorism because I am uh, slowly, very, very slowly, but surely, and it's taken me, uh, it's taken me a long time for experience. And when I end up writing a book on it, the book is going to kill me. But the book is going to be, I am I am determined that this book is going to be my magnum opus. It's going to be my great work. And um, what it is I'm working on uh, links between behaviorism and, and Jungian psychology. Because Jungian psychology is the most introverted psychology. It's all introverted. It's all, oh, archetypes, everything comes from instincts, everything's internal within you, and of course there's relationships with the external world with those instincts and with other people, but this is where we get into the extroversion of behaviorism, you see. So behaviorism is the most extroverted psychology, and Jungian psychology is the most introverted. Now, of course, there's a natural yin-yang thing there that that we can draw upon. And so it's a marriage made in heaven, if you think about it, the most extroverted psychology, most introverted psychology coming together in a union. And of course, Jung said himself, which is quite funny in uh, the face-to-face, uh, -face... no, I think it was the great minds of the 21st cent 20th century interview, actually, he said this. Well, it was one or the other, I forget. I've watched a lot of stuff on Jung. I've watched loads of interviews of all the Jungian analysts and stuff, so I forget where half of his stuff comes from, and I've read a lot. But it's in one of those two interviews, for sure, so you could find it in one of those if you watch both of those interviews. He says, it's almost a rule, although I don't want to make too many rules here, that an introvert should marry an extrovert. Of course, it's the, the yin-yang thing kind, kind of thing going on there. And... Uh, um, and so for me, behaviorism and Jungian psychology, it's kind of like that marriage, you know, it's kind of like that coming together of those, those two opposites. And so that's, that's very interesting for me. And that's something that I want to do. So I enjoyed behaviorism. Uh, in some aspects, it was a little bit confusing, even though it shouldn't have been confusing, but I, I found it very confusing anyway. I don't know why, but my brain couldn't wrap, wrap my head around it in certain aspects. Um, uh, but it was it's very interesting, and it, it's kind of like a deterministic psychology slash philosophy because it's a it's a psychology and a philosophy. Um, but it, it is very interesting, and of course, behaviorism is all the positive reinforcement. Uh, something that's called behavioral shaping, which is where you slowly shape your behavior so that then you can get to a, a, a new complete behavior. For example, you're scared of swimming, right? And, and exposure therapy comes into behaviorism quite a lot as well, um, which, which has implications for Jungian ideas and certainly with the Nietzschean idea of self-overcoming, uh, which can actually be fit into the Jungian tradition. And so we've got this link between behaviorism and kind of its links with with exposure therapy and then the Jungian's ideas of self-overcoming and, and, and Nietzsche's idea within that as well. And um, 
ideas in Jungian psychology, for example, integration of the hero archetype, which in itself um, translates to and, and, and becomes more cemented in the personality through exposure therapy, which then links back to positive reinforcement and all those behavioral shaping in behavior. You see where I'm going? See, it's good and it's cool. It's like, I'm very, I get very excited because, you know, oh, I can see these little links and, uh, oh, that might be a good little thing to do. So, um, no, no one steal my idea. Please, no one. Oh, God, I've, I've put my foot in it there. Everyone's going to steal. Oh, yes, I'm going to write a book on this now. Yes. No, um, it's, it's okay. I go, I, I go sufficiently deep. So, there's not going to be that many people who could follow me with regards to how deep I go because I, 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 I'm obsessive and I go, I'll, I'll be able to make links on a very, very deep level. So I'm sure there'll be someone watching this video who can go to the same level of depth as me because, of course, I'm not the only one out there. But um, no, I should be all right, you know, but I do shoot myself in the foot, though, don't I, with these things by just revealing my, my ideas and all the rest of it. Um, but then again, I suppose if I've put that in the video now, then I can lay claim to it, can't I? Because even if someone were to do it, this video gets published before they do it. And so therefore, then they say, oh, well, you know, there, there we go. There was the, the cementing of the idea. Although saying that, I could I could be unconscious of the fact someone else has done it before me. So there we go. Someone might have done it and I've... Uh, uh, and I can't do it. Well, I mean, I can do it, but it's just I'm repeating what someone else said or maybe saying it in a different manner, you know. But anyway, uh, behaviorism. So behaviorism, behavioral shaping, all that sort of stuff. So you're scared of swimming. That was the example I was just giving. You're scared of swimming and you want to get better. You, you want to make you want you want to overcome that. So what you do is you get a behavior analyst and then they go with you to the swimming bath or whatever and maybe the first time you just go there you watch people swimming if that's a, the, the basic level of all you can do because maybe you're really anxious about swimming so that's all you do you watch them first off and then you go out and then the next time you get your swimming costume on you go and you sit at the side of a pool you maybe even put your foot in or something like that if you can then the next time you go and you you maybe go down the stairs and you get like halfway down the stairs. Maybe you even get fully down the stairs into the pool. You stay there for a few minutes and okay, this is all right. Then the next time you go back and then you're fully in the pool. That would be like behavioral shaping in a sense. And obviously you'd want to try and do it in the best time scale possible but also you've got to be very very con considerate of the person because they might be incredibly anxious about that particular thing so it might take a long time or it might just take like a few times of doing it and then oh right actually I'm feeling better with it now and the more you do things like that for example in the idea the Nietzschean idea of self-overcoming the easier it gets because what what you're doing in a Jungian sense is of course you're integrating that hero archetype and so that hero archetype has got unconscious integration in your consciousness and so it becomes autonomous and 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 you just associate with the hero archetype and you can just overcome more easily I've seen it in myself like trying to get over my own neurosis and trying to get over my own um, psychological uh, deficiencies and things like that. And I've seen that at the start, I couldn't do things and because I, I, I didn't have much association with that hero archetype. Um, but then slowly and, and quite unconsciously in a manner, it started to integrate. I mean, obviously, I, I knew what I was doing. I knew I was trying to integrate it, but it was still integrating itself unconsciously within me in a sense. Then what happened, I mean, at the point I'm at now, I've got a good level of integration with the hero architect. That means that even when I'm faced with something that I'm scared of, I just rise to the challenge straight away. And it, there's not as much anxiety there or anything because I've got that association with the hero archetype within me. And so, and that's integrated within my personality as a part of my personality. It's not fully integrated. I've still got a bit of a way to go, but you know, it's there. And so that's what happens. And so your neuroticism decreases, your anxiety decreases from that socialization, that exposure therapy in line with that hero archetype coming into your consciousness. And 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 then, uh, and we could also say in a Jungian sense, the animus, because the animus doesn't have any links to the social persona. It doesn't have any links to the anima or anything like that specifically. And so it, it, the animus is, it doesn't have anxiety, as an archetype, it isn't, 
an anxious archetype, doesn't have any links to trait neuroticism, we would say, in a in a big five setting. And so therefore you you're also at the same time getting more integration with the animus and that that hero archetype alongside the animus. Um and so that's that's quite interesting actually and that um allows for that that progression. But yeah that's behaviorism anyway. We also did uh what was it in last semester we did? Behaviorism Oh, language and its disorders, which was looking at the development of language from being a baby, um, how it develops, what the process is of, is of development, um, the certain brain areas, Bronca's area, Wernicke's area, things like that, that are to do with uh, speech production and speech comprehension, stuff like that, and how that is expressed through us, the vocal tract, and how, of course, that helps us produce sounds and all the rest of it, and phonemes, and uh, what is it, morphemes, or I, I can't pronounce that anyway, morphemes or something like that, um, and all that sort of stuff, lexicon of words, that all the sort of semantics, all, you know, meaning, all that sort of stuff we went into, so that was quite, that was quite, that was quite a complex one for me, uh, and I didn't think we were going to do anything, I didn't think we would do anything like that in psychology with terms of language, I thought, well, you know, we might cover it in a couple of lectures, but I didn't think we would do an entire module on it. So uh, that was very interesting. And uh, we ended up kind of getting uh, a good a good ground in it. But it was, for me personally, it was quite complex. Um, it was, it, it was, especially how language is formed uh, in very, very early childhood, you know, in, well, really as a baby, that that was that was quite complex. That some of the ideas within that, not obviously the the way in which, well, of course, you know, you've got your environment here and your mum and dad talk to you and you assimilate the words and all that. Not that because that's quite a basic understanding. But the real depth of how the brain actually understands that language, because to the baby, well, the baby really, if you think about it could never understand that language in a sense because that's just gobbledygook to them. So the brain has to try and decode it and try and understand what that baby is talking, what that, what those people, what those words actually mean. And if you think that's a remarkable task and it's very complex because how can a baby pick out meaning when it's not had any prior experience to understand what the meaning could possibly be? You see, it's so... That's that's where it's complex, you know. That's where it's like, oh God, what? How the hell do we even think about this, you know? Um, but with that being said, it was quite interesting. This semester we did just to kind of quickly follow on, and and I'll try not to ramble too much. Although I probably will ramble on one of these because it was quite an interesting one. This semester we did the two core modules, as as I said, um, and we did um, stress and distress which is touching upon, upon clinical psychology. Uh, I did my assignment on that on social anxiety disorder, which was very, very interesting. Um, we touched upon a little bit of biological psychology. So that is the parasympathetic and the synthetic nervous systems, the auto non, non, autonomic nervous system, um, things like the fight or flight response is relating to that as well. Um, things like certain uh, neurochemicals and stuff, although we didn't go into too much detail on that. Um, and generally sort of um, a few pharmacological ideas, again, not too much on that. And uh, uh, we certainly touched upon anxiety, depression, drug addiction, you know, inclusive of obviously uh, illegal drugs, but also alcohol as well, uh, all sorts of things like that. We did touch quite a bit on binge drinking, um, on uh, how it affects uh, the body and how it affects the, the mind and things like that. Um, and it, it was interesting, but it was very heavy content. It was very heavy content. And uh, I think for a lot of students, they probably found it quite difficult because the thing is, it, it's not just the fact that it's heavy content, but it's quite close to home and it's quite hard hitting because a lot of people that I've talked to on the psychology course have, an, have anxiety, have depression or have had anxiety or have had depression. 
In fact, I would say 80% of the people I have met who have done psychology, who are on the course of psychology, have said to me, I have had generalized anxiety disorder. I have had issues with depression. I have done... In fact, I think 100% of the people I've met have had therapy, but one or two of them didn't really have any, you know, particular issues. They just had therapy specifically, uh, just for a very short time period, for whatever reason. But the point I'm making is, of course, that a lot of people have had that or have that right now. And uh, so, therefore, you know, when you're learning about anxiety or depression and you've had it or you've got it, it can be quite hard to learn about. And I felt that a little bit myself. I felt when I was learning about it, I felt, oh, you know, my anxiety is a bit higher. Um, and there is an actual uh, thing for that as well. It's uh, some sort of student's something disorder. And it's basically the disorder. I forgot the name of it, but it's a disorder where when students are learning about certain concepts, they either have the illusion or they get into the thought process that they actually have that. They actually have that thing. Now, of course, I know I have anxiety. So, of course, uh, it's not that's not an illusionary thing for me. That's not me learning about it on the lectures and then thinking to myself, oh, I have anxiety now. But actually, that is just the lectures impacting from a, from a stimulus point of view, the anxiety that's already present. Um, but of course, many people have that. And so I think that would have been quite a tough module because of the depth it went into uh, on those sorts of things. And it, and it may have just triggered some people a little bit, um, it, you know, in, in quite a big way. I mean, I was just about settled with it. I kind of got through. It was more early on in it. It was more of the first few weeks that I felt a little bit of heightened anxiety. But then I managed to just, I don't know, just somehow it, it just settled and, um, yeah, but I could see that would have been a hard one for some people. But that very interesting module, very interesting module, you know, on anxiety, depression, all the rest of it. Definitely interesting. Um, the other one we did this year was, uh, well, Brain and Mind was the one I wanted to talk about and maybe talk about in a little bit more depth, but not too much. But I'm wondering what was the other one? And I've literally, we've literally just, oh, Applied Psychology. So that is um, psychology in the real world. And I touched upon this before when I was talking about um, environment and the uh, psychology of, of the environment and things like that. That is That was inclusive within applied psychology. Now, in applied psychology, there's much more than that. We, we talked about the psychology of driving. We talked about the psychology of... Um, uh, for, we talked about forensic psychology, we talked about consumer psychology, so that is uh, things in, in the supermarket with to try and pull people in. I actually did a little bit of consumer psychology in my business degree, you know, just general things, more, more so on the business end, but there is some psychology in it. For example, concepts such as lost leaders in a supermarket when uh, they, they pull you in. And they, they, they basically, the supermarket will make a loss on an item. For example, it might be something basic like milk or bread. Uh, but they want, though, they want someone to come into the shop. And so they'll lower the price slightly of those items, get you into the shop. And they may even put the bread and the milk at another end of the shop. So then you have to walk all the way through the shop looking at every bloody other item before you get to the one item you've only come in for. And then what happens then, of course, is uh, you buy the bread and you think, oh, that's not too bad. That's a reasonable price. So you buy the milk milk, and you say, oh, that's not too bad. That's a reasonable price. And then you've looked at all the other stuff and you've walked out with a basket worth of shopping. So that's a bit of consumer psychology. There's also things like just basic things that we kind of learn about in, in the module. I mean, obviously, this is common knowledge. We all know about this where, you know, by the tills, we put, we put snacks and stuff like that. And they'll put things on certain shelf shelf levels, the, the particular things that they want to sell and all, all this sort of stuff. So that's kind of quite basic stuff that, that generally you could you could learn quite early on in, in business or in psychology. Um, but that was quite interesting for me because, it you know, it harkened back to doing the business degree and, and 
uh, and, and some of the things that I, I knew already in that. So that, that was quite nice, actually. Uh, and then the other one that was very interesting for me was brain and mind. And that is uh, cognitive neuroscience, basically, and, and mainly looking specifically in the brain and mind module at neuroanatomy, neurophysiology. And that was talking about the brain. And that was talking about, obviously, the anatomy of the brain. Uh, and it was very interesting. All the different areas of the brain. I learned so much in that. It was exactly what I wanted to do. I uh, read a neuropsychology book last year. And it was very good. And I was overwhelmed before I looked into neuropsychology or, or neuroanatomy or anything like that. I thought, oh, God, this is going to be like crazy complex. It's going to be far too much for me. I'll never do it. I'm not good enough to do it. Uh, but I know I need to learn about it because if I learn about it, then I'll be able to understand Jung a lot better because, of course, he, he was a medical doctor and he knew about all these structures of the brain and stuff. And I thought, well, if I can understand neuroanatomy, then I can understand what Jung was talking about with his concepts, you know, the subjective concepts, shall we say. But I can understand where he's got those from in the context of... Um, uh, I was going to say neurobiological setting, but I suppose a neuroanatomical setting or a neurophysiological setting. And um, specifically, not obviously not so much with the, the animal of the animus, although you, you can certainly draw quite obvious neurophysiological um, ideas with those two concepts, more so with the functioning of the, the body and like the the endocrine system and things like that um and even like certain instincts and stuff that's where you can more draw parallels with the animal and the animus uh, but i mean that does come into the brain within the pituitary, pituitary gland and i think even the, the hypothalamus might come into it slightly but that does come into it but more so what i learned was the dimensions of thinking and feeling and how that could relate uh, neuroanatomically to uh, prefrontal cortex, and I might have discussed this before, so I won't go into it too much, but the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala, and how possibly certain, because ev everyone's brain is unique, of course, and so certain people's who, certain people who have, let's say, um, slightly uh, bigger amygdala, let's say, or maybe who have reinforced emotional responses over time, or then you've got those other people who have maybe a slight difference in their prefrontal cortex, and they've reinforced thinking over time in their, in their, their actual life, their subjective life, then we could get some idea um, and it's quite a it has quite a strong foundation with regards to the thinking and feeling dimensions because if you've reinforced your intellect in the in the thinking dimension in your subjective experience, then of course you you've got a uh, let's say a stronger association with that that prefrontal cortex, the abstract thought, all that sort of stuff, and so naturally you neglect your feeling, you neglect your your emotion to to. Uh, in favor of in your kind of conscious life, looking at that intelligence and that intellect side of life. Conversely, if let's say you are reinforcing your emotion, you, you end up being quite an emotional person, even in a socialized setting, even disregarding, let's say, oh, well, you've got a bigger amygdala or you've got um, something, you know, different within your prefrontal cortex or whatever, you know, slight different structure, whatever it may be, even disregarding all that and just doing it from a socialized setting, you could say, well, you have a stronger association with your emotion and you neglect your your intellect and your thinking side. Now, what I think, it's probably a mix of both. Like some people, you know, a lot of people have genetically are wired more to use their prefrontal cortex, let's say, and then they're more thinking types and then more that sort of way. And then, let's say, uh, genetically, people are more wired to be the emotional side. But it's not fully that. It's it's like kind of partially, like 50% socialized. Well, it's like 50-50. So it's like socialized as well because you're, you obviously, over your life and your experiences, you respond to situations either in a thinking manner or a feeling manner. And if that's the case, then you'll reinforce that behavior. And then you might be 
over time you might become more thinking or over time you might become more emotional or more feeling so there you get the the thinking feeling types and it has to be that way because if you i mean as you will see it in empirical experience if you are very much on that line of intelligence and intellectual uh, debate then you do neglect your your emotional side and if you are very much in that feeling side you do neglect the thinking side. So it, there is that dichotomy there, and it is very much uh, something that could be founded within neuroanatomy or neurophysiology in whatever way you're going to do it, whether you're going to do it in a socialized manner or whether you're going to say, well, there's certain structural differences within the, the brain of, of, of everyone, really, and, and, and that kind of divides into these two dichotomies of thinking and feeling in the way of those particular two structures just mentioned. So it is, it seems very, very logical to, to think that way. And the more and more I have looked into the, the psychological types of, of Jung, the more I just think it, it's, it's so accurate. And um, it, it seems bizarre for people, for, for so many people to actually reject it and to think, well, no, it's it's not that way. The main, one of the main issues, there's a few main issues that people have with it. One of the main issues I'm more aware of is that it's too, people say it's too simplistic. But the problem is, do you want to overcomplexify it and then it kind of become laborious and convoluted? Or do you want to keep it simple, but have it define a universal and have it define something that is very much present there um, and that we can observe and that we can use as a, an, as, a, a, a as an objective scientific um, or an objective framework, let's say, to just understand people's basic associations with the world and how they interact with the world. You see, that's all the psychological types is. It's just a framework. And this is what Jung says himself. It's just a framework to understand how the person may relate to the world in a thinking manner, in a feeling manner, in a sensing manner, in an intuitive manner, etc. Um, and, and that's that. But the more I look into it, the more I do feel that there is this incredible association there that can be seen physically in, in, the, in the physiology of the body, or particularly in the brain, um, or, or the anatomy of the brain. Um, but no, it was very interesting brain of mind, absolutely wonderful. Uh, there were so many different things I picked up on it, so many different things we learned, uh, and it really gave me confidence with the fact that I can do neuroanatomy, I can do neurophysiology, it's something that is, is within my wheelhouse and uh, I can go deeper on it. Now bear in mind, I've, we did go, I mean, from the standpoint of let's say someone who's done a PhD in it, we didn't go that deep of course, but we did go into, we did look at a lot of structures Um. But of course, there's a further depth depth to go. There's always a lot of more depth to go in your anatomy, and um, so that'll interest me. Uh, and now I've got the foundation. I think I'll be okay. I am still a little bit nervous because I think, well, you know, there's a lot of uh, there is still a lot of complexity there to understand. But I understand axonal conduction now. I understand the the general processes of the brain, I understand the general brain areas and things like that, and particularly how they relate to subjective, well, what, what we could perceive as subjective function, you could actually perceive it as objective function, I suppose, in a way, but we could perceive as function anyway, and uh, so it's not too bad, but um, we'll see going forward, I think we do do it in another year, it might, might be next year, it could be next year, or maybe it's the year after, I'm, I'm not sure, but I think we do do it again anyway, and we go into a bit more depth, so that'll be good, um, and it's always something to consider for me to specialise in as well, so that'll be cool. So anyway, I think that's it, we did stress and de-stress, we did applied psychology, we did uh, brain and mind there, so that is, that is that was the course, I've given you a, I said I wasn't going to give you an in-depth view of the course, but you know what it's like with me, I end up digressing or rambling, 
Um, but hopefully the information I provided you there was was good and was well-rounded and stuff. I try to make it as well-rounded as I can and as structured as I can. Um, but yeah, so that was the year. So let's just end now. We're coming up to an hour. Let's just end now for 10, 15 minutes on the more personal side. Because I've talked, I mean, I've talked briefly about my personal associations with the uh, topics. But of course, I've talked quite generally and quite uh, logically about the uh, the content of of those those modules, really. So um, it's been a good year, as I mentioned. It's been very interesting. Um, I talked a little bit about the scientific side and my kind of maybe somewhat resistance to that and trying to overcome these two things within me, the spirituality and the science and trying to get a balance between those two. And that was very much the theme of the entire year. It very much was a theme of the entire year, trying to get that balance right between my personal reading with regards to depth psychology and things like that and spirituality as well and uh, and uh, mythology. That was the other one. And, of course, the very scientific stuff. That was, And it's always going to be hard for me. But I think I'm going to struggle with that for at least the next five years of my life, trying to really see the beauty in the scientific side and trying to also... Um, I don't know, kind of experiment with putting the scientific microscope onto spirituality and also, aside from that, investing a little bit of science, uh, spirituality into science in a scientific manner and being able to kind of understand mythology and spirituality and these certain concepts within depth psychology that do hold a place within modern scientific psychology and that do certainly help and have been proven to help uh, different people with obviously getting over anxiety, depression, etc. And so they do have, they do hold a place in 21st century uh, modern psychology. And so for me, it's just going to be coming to terms with that, overcoming that, holding that tension of the opposites and being able to just work with that and uh, and see the beauty in both of those sides of my life. Because it's weird. It really is weird. I am a scientist, but I'm also spiritual. And a lot of people are like that. There's many, many people who are like that. There's many, many uh, scientific people who are uh, spiritual or are religious. But it is a hard thing to contain within your personality because they are opposites, in a sense. They are opposite, But they, they are opposite opposites that are non-dual. You can't have one without the other. And, um, so especially like science and religion specifically. And so the one affirms the other and the other affirms the one. You see, the most religious person I know is, uh, hang on, I forgot his name now. Is it Richard Dawkins, the new atheist guy? I've, 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 I've heard his name so many times and yet I forgot it. But no, I think, I think it's Richard Dawkins anyway. Bloody mind's gone blank. Um, but no, the most religious guy I know is him, because if you watch him on the Joe Rogan podcast, right, he goes into loads of different religions, loads of different traditions, and he's researched all these things very conscientiously, and uh, yet he's meant to be the most atheistic person ever. But in order to be the most atheistic person ever, you see, he's got to research into all this religion to try and counteract it. And in the process... He becomes more religious than anyone else because of the amount of knowledge he's got on religion. He know, he knows more about religion than some religious people, you see. So they're non-dual. You can't have one. The more atheistic you go, the more religious you become. And the more religious you become, the more atheistic you become. Or the more, let's say, the more you understand atheism. Uh, in, in your own psyche, for example, let's say you're very, very fervently religious, then ultimately what arises in your in your psyche and in your unconscious behavior is a real firm rejection of atheism. But you see, it's it's present even more than it would be if you were just mildly religious, because now you're extremely religious. You've got suddenly you've got this very, very prominent uh, fervent hatred against atheism. So it's more prominent within you. So 
the more religious you become, the more atheistic you become. The more atheistic you become, the more religious you become. They are non-dual. You cannot have one without the other. But yet, people will persist in their folly, as what says that Bla William Blake says. Um, they will persist in their folly, and they will think that you can just have atheism and cut off religion. Or they will think you can just have religion and cut off atheism. You cannot do it. It's atheistic religion and it's religious atheism. That's what it is. That's life. That is what life is. Um, you know, it's scientific spirituality or it's spiritual scientism. Well, scientism isn't really a word, but spiritual scientisticness or whatever. Again, it's not a word, but it's very interesting. It should be a word. That is a good word. Scientisticness. That is a good one. Um, but no, so it is that, you know, but people won't. You won't bother if you don't see it you know if you don't see it it, it, it is ridiculous as well it's ridiculous because they get too much in the shadow you see they're too much in the shadow we get possessed by it so we don't see that it's their own shadow working within them instead so for example richard, richard dawkins doesn't know that lives within but what lives with inside himself is a very very religious personality that is his shadow but he doesn't see it and he projects it out onto all these other religious folk. Whereas, clearly, he's got that within him because he's so really, he's so religiously um, uh, aware. He's aware of all these religions, and that's his religious personality coming through him. But yet, he won't accept it. He'll just project it. He, instead of accepting the fact that he is, uh, let's say, he, he does have a lot of knowledge on religion, and, and, you know, accepting that fully within himself, he just projects it out, you know. But I mustn't be too uh, critical because when I saw him on that interview, and I will say this about him, he does have a very conscientious, rational, and and very considered outlook on these things. You know, he he does have that. He does have. This, he's thought things through. He has really thought things through, and he has looked at it in a conscientious manner. So I I have to say that he, uh, uh, as an individual for me, he's spot on with that. He's spot on. And um, I can't criticise him at all for that. Um, he, he is good with that. But of course, the shadow still works within him and he does project it out in a certain manner as well. But, you know, the, the general conscientiousness and stuff like that is very much there within him. So I don't want to appear as if, oh, well, I'm just you know, spiting this person or anything, because no, I, I, and, uh, I don't feel like that at all, and, and I like to look at people in a very human manner, so yeah, of course, um, uh, there might be things within people that I see, but the, ultimately, there, there are a lot more than that, you know, they're not just that one thing or anything, so, uh, and I think that that's what can bog people down quite a lot, and that's, that's a folly of the shadow again, where you get into that thinking of, well, you know, uh, oh, well, that's, that person just this one thing, you know, that's, they're that, and I, I'm not having that, I don't like that, and they project it out, you know, and they're that, just that, but they're not, you know, no one is ever just that, everyone's very, very expansive, everyone's very, there's intricacies, there's differences, people are very contradictory as well, people are very, um, they think, uh, they, they, they may say one thing, but then in six months' time, they say another that's diametrically opposed. I do that. But that's the nature of living. You get more experience, and then you, you realign certain comments and stuff like that. And, uh, and and the one thing is people don't have a lot of sympathy with that. You know, people think people think you should be hold one viewpoint for 15, 15 years or 50 years of your life or whatever, and that's you. And, and I can peg, and I don't know who it was who said this, um, oh, I think it was Grace and Perry, although I might be getting it wrong, but people like to think, well, I can peg you into that hole, and I'm practically using his words there, if it is Grace and Perry, by the way, I don't want to uh, put a quote onto someone who it isn't, but I think it might have been Grace and Perry, but no, we can put you into a hole, you know, and that's who you are, and people do that, you know, and and uh, but that's not the case, you know. People are much more than that, and and much different, much much more different and expansive. But yeah, so it was good. It's been good. It's been good. It's been a challenge. Uh, I can't tell you my grades because I've not got back all of my grades yet. Last semester I got C's and B's. I got one. I got one A, and I got 
maybe two or three Bs, and I got, again, like two or three Cs, two, maybe even three or four Cs between the assignments and the, the exams, of course. So that wasn't too bad. First semester, I've had a, I've had a five-year break from education. That was good, considering that I had had a five-year break from education. I've never done psychology at A-level. I've never done it in high school. I've, I've never done it academically. So I was I was happy with that. This semester, I got one result back. Uh, I've got one result back, which was uh, a B plus, which I'm happy with. Um, which I, well, I was annoyed with because I was 0.67 percent off an A. Y you know that always annoys students when they're like literally 0. odd off an A. That would, but anyway, it was cool. I'll take a B plus. I'm happy with that. That was into statistics, so. I'm, that's good, that's good for me, um, and uh, I don't know my other results, but I, I do know that I was a bit more conscientious this semester, and I did put in more detail and depth within my assignment, so I would say that when I get my results back at late June, that I've probably done all right, I probably have done all right, um, it would be really good to get like all B's and like no C's, like all B's and above, but you know, I don't think it's, I think I might get one C, it's probably going to be the case, I'll get one C, but if I, you know, if I could get all B's, that'd be really good, you know, that'd be very, very interesting, um, but yeah, so that, that's good, um, and you know, with regards to the lectures and stuff, the lectures weren't too bad, um, with regard, we, we have, we had about 15 hours worth of lectures a week, and then you obviously, you're writing notes on them and things like that. Well, I did in the first semester, I didn't in the second semester. Because what I realised was, all of the lectures are uploaded online. And I I think they will be as well when we're back into the uh, in-person sessions. So instead of wasting loads of time writing notes, what I thought to myself was, well, what I'll do is I'll watch the lectures. I'll be very attu uh, attuned into the lecture, really absorb it. And then for my revision, I'll just watch all the lectures again and I won't do my notes because I didn't f feel that I needed that. And anyway, I was a little bit worried at the end of the second semester because I thought, hang on a minute, I didn't pick up on as much this semester because I because I didn't write my notes, right? So I was a little bit worried. I thought, oh, I've made a mistake here. But then what I did is I, I just plowed on and I sat down one day, I got up early sat down one day, started the lectures of one of the modules, went through all of the lectures, and, you know, I was really confident, I was really confident, so I think I might try notes again next year, just to be on the safe side, but I don't think I actually need them, if I'm read if I'm doing my revision in that way, of watching all the lectures again, I also, for brain and mind, they gave us handouts, which are like, you know, five pages per lecture, uh, basically like a written out version of the lecture and uh, so I read all the hand well no not all of them I read about 70% of the handouts um, as well as well as watching the lectures so you see that did it for me that was enough and I managed to uh, well I felt like I did okay on the exam we'll see but I felt like I did pretty good and I was very confident especially on that brain and mind exam so you know, I don't know about the notes, you know, really for me, I think that that might be, eh, is it necessary, isn't it, you know, but we'll see next year, we'll see what I can do, and we'll see whether I choose to do the notes, or whether I don't choose to do the notes, because um, ultimately, I think that it might make a subtle difference, it might be a little bit better to do the notes, but I don't think it's going to be crazy, crazy better or anything like that, but I would always suggest to people, you know, in the first year, do your notes, you know, I'm a bit of a kind of one on my own, I just, I, I've always been like, I don't like, I've, I've never really liked the idea of being taught, I like, I'm, I'm kind of like a person who likes to teach myself, um, I'm, I'm getting more, um, tolerance of the idea of being taught, you know, and that's a good thing, because you should always be open of being taught by people, um, that's something that I'm learning as well, but, you know, I am one of those people who's quite, um, oh, what's the word, uh, begins with an A, begins with an A,
Uh, it's got, it'll probably come back at some point. But I'm one of those people who's just one on their own, who it, it, it likes to do it their way. You know, I have, I have that kind of mentality in me and it and uh, it's not always good that I mean it can be quite good it can be quite conducive to success but on the other side it's always not it's not always good because you kind of close yourself off to certain things and uh, arrogant that's the that's the, yeah is that word yeah I think that is the right word I'm arrogant and I'm intellectually arrogant in more ways than one but intellectually arrogant in the sense of I, I want to do it myself, you know, I, I want to, very, very specifically in that way, I want to do it myself, um, um, and so, yeah, that, but that's just how it is for me, so, but other, other people maybe do it in a different way, just try out what works for you, what's best for you, and you might be like me, and you might be a bit one on your own, and if you are one on your own, go with your own gut instinct, don't just go, I mean, of course, be open to being taught and absorb the lecture content and all the rest of it and really uh, look at that with an open mind and with humility, but also be the one on your own because that's your, that's the way your brain works. That's the way your individuality is. If you are just someone who likes to do independent study, you know, reading things and, and thinking about things in an abstract way that are totally far removed from uh, just the, the way of, typical lecture-based study uh, at university. I think that that's always very, very necessary, actually, for, for a lot of people. Um, but other than that, that was that was the course anyway. I suppose I'll very, very briefly talk, touch about, um, you know, living in halls and things like that. It's been really good living in halls. Um, when I first got here, of course, I didn't know, I, well, I knew two people I'd be living with, and I had them on Snapchat, and uh, I didn't know anyone else. I didn't know how many people would be here, or the rest of it. Now, I won't go into the issues that we've had in halls. We have had some issues, but the issues have been resolved. Um, quite uh, big issues, quite serious issues, um, but of course, it's not the place to go, on, go into that on video, so I will not do that. Uh, but what I do want to say is that overall, it's been a very pleasant experience living in halls. And um, the people I've met here, the people in my flat and the people who I'm going to be living with next year, I absolutely adore. And um, it's wonderful. It's been absolutely wonderful. Um, I've met some great friends. I've met so many people who are doing psychology and who are on my kind of wavelength, I've met about, I've not met as many people who enjoy dream interpretation, but those who I have met who enjoy it, I know I can go to and I can talk to my dreams to, and that's brilliant, because that's what I wanted, we don't do anything about dreams, or Jungian psychology, or anything like that, in the the academic realm of, of the degree I'm doing, we just don't, so I need an outlet for that, and I, we, I am very conscious of the fact I need an outlet to talk to people about that. Even to, of course, share my dreams with them and they share their dreams with me and have that back and forth and think, oh, well, I wonder what this could mean. I wonder what this means in the context of my life, of your life, etc. I need that. That is something, that sort of more spiritual side of psychology, that dream, the dreams, the intuitive side, the, the depth psychology side. I need that. And so, uh, and I know other people do as well. And so it was, it's been brilliant to meet people like that and to actually really um, enjoy the experience of, of talking to people about these concepts. And I've met some marvelously intelligent people, marvelously intelligent. And I've met some beautifully wise people as well. Um, and uh, it's just been wonderful. It just really has. And next year, my plan, because of course, I've not been able to meet as many people as I would normally, it, you know, because of COVID, we're all doing our lectures online in our rooms. We only went to two or three in-person lectures all year. That was it. No, sorry, I went to five or six, actually. There's a few in the first semester. But that was it. So we didn't really get to meet that many people. So... Uh, my next plan for next year is to meet some more people. Again, some more like-minded people. 
preferably if I can, another couple of people who are interested in the Jungian stuff, in the dreams and things like that. And uh, I love that. And I love discussing these things with people. And, and of course, when people have that same interest, they love discussing it too. So it's an equal thing we can share. It's a mutual thing that we can we can enjoy together. And discussing certain dreams like um, pers perspective dreams, which Jung, Jung called pers perspective dreams, the future dreams, things like that. And discussing things that are synchronous and discussing things that um, uh, certain concepts in dreams and alchemical concepts and mandala symbolism and all this sort of richness that is very, very beautifully symbolic. That's something that I have to have. Have to have. I've had to have that for years now. Well, not years, but at least a couple of years. And uh, it's something that I've absorbed myself so much within and something that's so rich for me. Um, with scientific journal articles and stuff, I never seem to get that level of richness. I can get a certain level of richness out of scientific journals and I can have a lot of fun doing them. But I can never get that real deeper richness of, oh, well, there was a crow in my dream last night and it symbolised this particular thing in alchemy and this particular thing happened in my dream and also this particular thing happened in real life that aligned with my dream. I mean, that's so spiritually rich and it's got a... Um, I'll use a word that Lillian, uh, a Jungian analyst, uh, used um, to, to describe Jung. She said Jung was always looking for that metaphysical food, I think she called it. Was it metaphysical food or or religious food or so, something like that? I think it was metaphysical food was the exact word she used. He's always looking for that metaphysical food. And uh, that's a very, very good phrase. It's it's a phrase that describes an insatiable appetite towards the uh, symbolism within religion, symbolism within, within alchemy, symbolism within spirituality, and how that can come into uh, 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 the reality of the psyche and the reality of dreams and the reality of experience and how that can actually be an incredibly deep, enriching and numinous experience and uh, so I need that so it, it, beautiful that I found people like that and uh, I've really met a bunch of people that are like my people that's what I feel I feel like they're my wavelength and I think they feel it about me as well and and so that's really that's good that's brilliant I couldn't have wished I couldn't have wished for anything better now, you'll know also in my tone of this video, I'm being a little bit more emotional. Now, what I'm doing at the moment is I'm trying to counteract that thinking attitude within me that I've talked about with more of that feeling attitude. I'm trying to be very, very conscious of that, of developing that feeling function within me. Um, and so that's what I want to do moving forward. And, and I think that really... I mean, of course, that's more of a conscious thing within me and a development within me internally. But I think having friends who are very feeling, all of my friends are what we would class in, practically all of my friends are what we would class in a Jungian manner as feeling types. Now, I myself am a bit of a weird one. I am a, technically a feeling type. I'm an IN, I'm an IN in bracket F type in a Jungian typology sense. But I reinforced my thinking function from a very young age in a very neurotic manner. So actually, I'm more of an IN bracket T type. And my feeling function is actually quite inferior and quite childish, quite infantile. So um, I'm trying to get that relationship and I'm trying to understand that in relation to all of these very, very emotional and feeling friends that I have and trying to get a better association with that side of myself but is very much present because, of course, natu more naturally I'm a feeling type but more kind of reinforced in, a, in more, kind of like a negative manner, let's say, is that very, very fervent, directing intellect that I possess that is just very, very harsh and unfeeling. 
this is what I was talking about, about when you really absorb yourself in the thinking domain, you really do neglect the feeling domain. And when you really absorb yourself in the feeling domain, you neglect so much of the thinking domain. And so, and I know that from ex from my own experience, very, very obviously, and you can then just make parallels with neuroanatomy, or you can make parallels with, uh, you know, certain frameworks that we have. But yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. So that's what, I've, uh, again, that's what I'm trying to do consciously in this video as well. Reduce that thinking type, reduce that thinking function, bring that feeling function up. And so that then I've got that balance there. And and believe me, it's the hardest thing for me to do. And it, And it's not, sometimes it's not a nice thing to me to do because the feeling aspect of life just turns me off so much in some circumstances. I just think, oh, how can you be so feeling and how so, oh, you know, so lovely about things and, and not, not analytical or not intellectual or not logical in any way? Because I am, I, I'm so just reinforced that logical sense within myself and, and, um, and so, you know, to be feeling is like the total alien opposite. And, uh, uh, but, you know, I'm starting to see um, the real beauty in the feeling function and the feeling relationship to life and the romanticism within that as well. And the, the, almost like the spiritual beauty of that relationship with the world. Um, and so, uh, it, you know, it's something we all have to do. We all have to think about these things and balance ourselves in certain ways. I mean, especially for a psychologist. I mean, not so much. I mean, I would argue that everyone should do it. But, you know, if you're, let's say, just you, you've got another job or whatever, um, then, of course, you, you don't do it to, to a, a high degree or anything. Although it would be good for everyone to do it to a certain degree. Um but, you know, specifically for me as a psychologist, I think it's paramount, it's paramount for me to be centered and for me to really understand myself in a, in a good way so that then I can balance these things and, and have good relationships with people and, and, and understand um, other people as well more and to be inclusive of their view, um, to be inclusive of what they need as a personality, to be inclusive of um, certain negative tendencies within them that maybe me being more centered will just help naturally. Uh, you know, there's all these different things. But no, that's just a bit. So living in halls, uh, just to conclude, it is, it has been brilliant. Um, it's really made me so much more independent it's made me so much more just like getting out there, doing things, just being the person I need to be. Um, it just has. It just, it, I have really, and it really happened very quickly, almost as soon as I got to Halls. As soon as I got to Halls, I knew I was just right. Like, I'm going for this. And uh, it, it just did very, very quickly make me that sort of person that I needed to be. And... Uh, because of that, I, uh, I've grown as a person over the last year and uh, that'll continue to happen for, for a while to come, really. It's going to be uh, a continual process of growth and of understanding myself and of understanding certain dimensions of myself that um, will mean that, that I become uh, a better person in the process. And that's good. And that's what we all need. So, um, you know, we all need to think about bettering ourselves and encouraging positive parts within, within us and certain things that are neglected within us and all that sort of stuff. So with that being said, I'll, I'll wrap up there. I don't want to ramble anymore. I mean, God, we've been on for an hour and a half. I, I didn't think, I honestly didn't think this video would be quite this long. Maybe thinking like 45 minutes or something like that, but we, we double that now. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for watching, guys. Um, and yeah, I will see you in the next one. So See you very soon, guys.